Hey everyone, welcome back to First Hand Globe Trotting. I haven't been able to travel lately, so today I'm back with another throwback vlog. This one is part three of a trip I took to Melbourne, Australia in 2017. So far, my trip here has been incredible. It's my first time ever in Australia, and I got to explore Melbourne, see some incredible street art in the city's laneways, go on a day trip down the Great Ocean Road to see some breathtaking coastlines, try some food that was invented here in Melbourne, look down on Melbourne from one of the tallest buildings in the Southern Hemisphere, and so much more. In case you missed the first two parts, links are in the video description. It's day five today, and I'm heading out of the city to Phillips Island to see some penguins. I hopped into the tour van, and we drove about an hour and a half outside Melbourne, but made an unexpected stop down a tiny road surrounded by fields. It was raining out, so I wasn't really sure what we were doing here. But see off in the distance, more kangaroos. Just like when I went on my Great Ocean Road Tour, I got to see kangaroos on one of the first stops of the day. We got to go out into a little field and hide behind a little mound of dirt with tall grass covering it so we could get a better look. Last time I only saw one kangaroo standing around, but there were so many of them this time. They were all hopping around, almost like a little kangaroo parade going by me. This was so cool. Maybe if I stayed in Australia for a few months I'd eventually get sick of seeing wild kangaroos everywhere, but as of right now I'm still loving them. After another 15 minutes in the van, we made a lunch stop on the mainland before driving over the big bridge to Phillips Island. Just enough time to grab a quick meal and a drink before the long day ahead. Then it was back into the tour van and off to the island. The penguins don't show up until nighttime, so we got to make a few other stops along the way. The first place we checked out was the Koala Conservation Center. It's a reserve where scientists research and study koalas in their natural habitat, so there's a lot to learn here. But if you're anything like me, you're probably most interested in getting outside and seeing some. There's a forested area with a few short paths running through it and some treetop boardwalks you can explore. So pretty much as soon as I got there, I headed outside and started searching the trees for any koala sightings. I'm exaggerating a bit since this is a koala sanctuary, so you don't need to be a wilderness expert to find them. They have these big fenced off boardwalk areas with signs that list how many koalas are inside. As soon as you walk through the gate, the path takes you off ground level and up onto an elevated boardwalk. And once I got up into the trees, it wasn't very long before I met a koala. Seeing one out in the wild a few days ago was definitely more exciting since it was so unexpected, but this was a great experience too. Just look at how close it is, only a few feet away. It's just hanging out in a tree, chewing on some leaves. I really liked the treetop boardwalk, it made it feel like you were walking around in a treehouse. And the views of the animals were way better than if I had been on the ground. Even though there's a small fence all around the boardwalk area, this little guy still found a way inside. I guess it must have jumped right over the fence. There was another boardwalk area, so after I finished looking around the first one, I headed over there. A lot of the koalas seemed a little lazy, so I think we must have shown up during their afternoon naps. I thought this was a really great place. As I've said before, koalas were one of the Australian animals that I was really hoping to see, so it was nice to be able to visit them in this cool treetop boardwalk area. Not quite the same as the wild, but I got to see so many of them up in the trees. I spent a little bit of time walking through the forest paths and looking around, but if there were any other animals out there, they were doing a great job of hiding from me. Today has been mostly about the animals, but it seems like you can't go very far around here without finding an amazing coastal view. We stopped at the Nobbies, where you can go along a little boardwalk path to have a look at the Phillips Island coastline and the rocky shore. This area is so different from what I saw when I visited the Great Ocean Road. I would have been impressed if Victoria had one nice area of coastline, but the fact that you get so many different and unique coastal views all within a few hours of Melbourne is incredible. If you're lucky, a lot of times there are seals hanging out around the Nobbies, but unfortunately they didn't come to say hello to me today. I've been spending this trip exploring Melbourne and doing day trips and trying to pack as much fun stuff into my trip as I can. 
but I honestly think I could spend a week in a little cabin on the coast just relaxing and I'd have a perfectly good vacation. Give me some food and drinks and maybe a book and I could easily keep myself entertained watching the waves roll in. Our next stop was for a short hike at Swan Lake. The whole path is only about a kilometer and a half along flat trails, but it gave us another chance to get out into a Phillips Island forest for a look around. Some of the trees stood so straight, so without foliage they reminded me of a bunch of toothpicks sticking out of the ground. And off in the trees, there was someone keeping an eye on us and seeing what we were up to. It stayed so still and really blended in with the branches, but didn't seem too scared to see a group of humans wandering around. We came out of the forest part to a boardwalk area, and there were a few wallabies waiting there for us. I'll admit, I'm not all that confident in my ability to tell the difference between kangaroos and wallabies, but I think these ones are wallabies. I've read that the main difference is that wallabies tend to be smaller and have more colorful fur, and these ones look that way to me. But I could be completely wrong and have things all mixed up. No matter what they are, it was so great to be able to see them up close in this grassy area. We had such a great view of them, and luckily we didn't scare them off. I'd been focusing so much on the ones right in front of me that it took me a long time to realize that if I turned around there were even more of them on the other side of the boardwalk. I don't know if this area is always a super popular wallaby hangout, or if we just got lucky, but it was so great to be able to see so many of them. The trail's called Swan Lake, so you probably guessed we were going to eventually come to some water. And right near the shore, there were some black swans. I've only ever seen white swans before, but these ones are native to Australia. That's what I love so much about this vacation. Pretty much every animal I've seen has been something I've never seen in the wild before. And look at the baby cygnets out there swimming with their parents. They were more of a light gray color, so if no one had told me they were black swans, I would have just assumed that they would grow up to be the white swans I normally see. This is an incredibly peaceful and quiet spot, especially if you like bird watching. This entire day has been amazing, but it's time for the main event, the penguin parade. Every day, hundreds of penguins go out fishing in the water. When it starts getting dark, they all swim back to their homes on Phillips Island for the night, and that's the penguin parade. They live in little nests, like this one that you can peek into at the visitor center. I guess this little guy must have stayed home for the day. As it got closer to sunset, a park ranger led us out to our seats by the water so we'd be waiting for them. Unfortunately, a lot of the footage that I'm going to show you of the penguin parade isn't the best. They don't allow photography because the lights can scare and distract the penguins, but the park ranger I was with said that I could record as long as my camera was completely covered. That meant that my viewfinder was covered, so my aim on some of these shots is a little bit off, and the pitch darkness doesn't help either. But do you see those sparkling things out there? That's the penguins. You just see these big groups of them swimming in together and making landfall on the beach. It was incredible to see. After they make it to land, they waddle their way up onto the island to find their house for the night. You can walk along the boardwalks and see them wandering around below you, and it's hard to go more than a few seconds without another penguin walking by you. As you can probably tell, these are really tiny penguins. The videos I'm showing you really don't do it justice. It's a type of thing you definitely need to see yourself to get a sense of just how many penguins come home to Phillips Island every night and how cute they are to look at. I loved it, and I'd definitely come back again if I had the chance. I've never seen anything like this before. After saying goodbye to the penguins, we headed back to Melbourne, wrapping up an incredible day seeing so many animals. On to day six, and I was ready to see more of the laneways and alleyways in Melbourne. The first one I started with was Meyer's Place. As I was wandering around, I thought it looked pretty average compared to some of the more impressive ones that I've seen around town. There were a few businesses down here, and some street art on the walls, but it was mostly a nondescript alleyway. Well, it turns out I just came in the wrong end of the laneway. Check this out, a huge, complete building jungle mural. I thought this was a really nice piece of art, especially how the mural flowed around the windows and doors. Since I was already near Chinatown, I decided to head back and check out one of the laneways that I missed when I was there a few days ago. 
This one is Tattersall Lane, and even though it wasn't as covered with art as some of the other alleys, it had some nice stuff hidden away. Probably my favorite piece there was down a little side alley up on the second story of a building. That's one of the things I really loved about the Melbourne street art. If you were just driving around the main roads, you'd never see it. You have to wander around these little alleyways to find these hidden gems. Most of my time so far has been exploring the little alleyways and laneways, but Melbourne also has a few pedestrian arcades that are worth exploring. This one is Block Arcade. The alleys seem just like you'd expect alleyways to look, dark and kind of grimy. But this arcade was completely different. First off, it's covered, so that obviously makes it a lot cleaner. But everything in it just seems so upscale and high-end. It's laid out in an L shape, and at the corner there's a big circular area with a beautiful tiled floor and a really nice dome ceiling to let the light in. The entire place had such a fancy and upper-class atmosphere, almost like it was too nice to be a public shopping area. This is nearly the complete opposite of all the graffiti-filled alleyways that I've been exploring so far. But don't worry, if Block Arcade is too fancy for you, it's attached to Block Place that gets you back into that open-air laneway feeling. There seem to be a lot of restaurants and cafes down there. The other place I found was Royal Arcade. And it's a good thing I did, since a little rain started so it was nice to find a covered spot. This one has a really loud design, with colorful statues looking down on you when you walk in, and then black and white checkerboard pattern floors. The arcade has a lot of light coming in, with big windows running all the way along the top of the walls and ceiling. The design made it seem really long, with the hall stretching out in front of me. The arcade was laid out in a T-shape, with the main hallway making the top of the T, and then a smaller, less busy part branching off near the middle. Royal didn't have the same high-class look and feeling of Block, but I found the design was really loud and definitely drew my attention. It's hard to describe, but I liked how it was both kind of beautiful and a little unusual at the same time. A few blocks down from my hotel along Flinders Street was a big church, St. Paul's Cathedral. I'd walked by it so many times over the past few days, and I got picked up for my Great Ocean Road day trip outside of it, so I figured I may as well pop inside and see what it's like. Plus, I seem to go into a church or two in every city I visit, so why stop now, right? I always love stained glass, so it was nice to see that even the entrance had some. There wasn't anything in here that really blew me away or caught my attention, but overall it was just a nice looking church. It has Gothic Revival architecture, and while I'm by no means an architecture expert, I do love seeing all the pointed arches and long pinnacles sticking up. Something about Gothic buildings seems really old and sinister, almost like they're going to be some sort of monster's lair. It's kind of unusual since so many of the churches I visit have that design, but that's just the feeling I get when I see this sort of architecture. But as you can see, the inside isn't nearly as sharp and imposing as the outside. There were big, two-tone pillars supporting the arches and some really nice windows up top, so it seemed to let in a lot of light and made it fairly bright inside. This trip had been going so well for me so far, but some technical difficulties made the end of my trip a little trickier. I was recording all of these clips on my phone, and a few minutes after I left the cathedral, I noticed that my phone decided that Melbourne was a good place to stop working. So for the rest of this video, the visuals aren't really going to match what I'm talking about, but hopefully it's better than nothing. I was super frustrated since I use my phone for pretty much everything on vacations, but at least it happened near the end of my trip. I wasn't going to let it ruin things for me, since tonight I was going to see an Australian Rules football match at Etihad Stadium. I knew absolutely nothing about the sport and had never seen it played before, but it's hugely popular in Melbourne so it seemed like a great idea. Almost all of the pro teams are based out of the state of Victoria, so if you're going to watch Aussie Rules football, this is the place to do it. I really wish I had some clips to show you. They play on a big oval field with 18 players on each team, so there was a lot going on. Lots of energy and action and excitement. As the game went on, I think I mostly figured out what was happening and what the rules were, and I had an amazing time there. I've mentioned this in other videos, but anytime I have a chance to see a sport being played in a city where it's popular, I always try to buy a ticket and experience that. I loved it and would definitely recommend going to see an Aussie Rules football match if you get a chance.
When I woke up on day seven, it was unfortunately time to leave Melbourne and go home. This was an absolutely amazing trip and really lived up to my expectations. Melbourne was such a great city with so much to see and do, plus within a few hours drive, you can see some breathtaking natural beauty. And I didn't really talk about this in my videos, but the food was incredible. I don't think I had a bad meal the entire time I was here. As I said before, Australia is a country I had wanted to visit for so many years and that I had heard so many great things about. But actually being here was even better than I expected or hoped. It was so fun. Australia is such a huge country and this trip definitely makes me want to come back and see even more of it. So that's it for this trip. If you missed the other two parts, there are links to them in the video description. And if you have any questions, ask me in the comments. While you're at it, like the video, share it with your friends, and subscribe to my channel. On Instagram, I'm firsthand globe trotting. On Twitter, I'm firsthand globe. Follow me on there. And don't forget, it's an incredible world out there, so pick up your passport and do some firsthand globe trotting of your own.